Hello, and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. My name is Chris Muntz, and this is going to be a relatively short bonus episode about my plans for a hybrid rehearsal structure. If you're like me, you have seen a ton of ideas for online activities that come out like constantly there are people innovating creating different engaging ways to do online activities and that's wonderful Uh, we need to keep students engaged when they are not physically present in the classroom i've talked about this on the show several times already however what about those of us who are thrust into some type of new world new age type of rehearsal environment where uh, we see the kids sometimes and then we're online again or we see part of the kids and the other kids are at home, or any of these types of interesting and compelling, I'm sure, but very complicated rehearsal structures. In that case, what do we do? We're going to have some chances in those types of situations to sing, most likely. We're going to have some type of way to rehearse, but those rehearsal minutes become then super precious. They're not going to be very many. So what are the types of things that you prioritize? What are the types of things that you let go? These are my thoughts at this point. And unfortunately, I I can't offer you some tried and true things that can be done in this case for obvious reasons. I'm still trying to figure it out. But I thought today for this little bonus episode, I would try to figure it out while recording myself, uh, figure it out. I've got some ideas already formulated, uh, some resources already created, but this is just my chance to kind of share with you some things that I've been thinking about the hybrid environment. Um, I've seen some polling done on some Facebook groups where it seems like a fairly large percentage of us will be either teaching in person or hybrid. Um, it's a kind of a, it's interesting because you don't necessarily get that impression from watching my Facebook feed and conversations. I'm seeing a lot of articles about schools going online, but when I look at polls of choir directors, it looks like quite quite a few of us will be having some contact time and doing some type of socially distanced, ventilated, masked rehearsing of some kind or outside or or whatever uh, your solution is in your building or outside of your building. So here's what I'm thinking. The first, my first thought it is related to the maximization of whatever time we do have together. So my first question for myself has become, what can go online? What are, if, if, if our priority is to have some rehearsal time in whatever precious minutes we get with our students and our singers, what other stuff that would normally be incorporated into the rehearsal can move out of the rehearsal into an online space. And of course, for many of us, our online environments are very different. I, my district uses Schoology. I, I, there's Canvas is another one, Google Classroom. A lot of you are using these types of things. And I don't think for this discussion, it really matters. But what types of things can you move out of your rehearsal into that online environment? So here were my first thoughts. Obviously, most types of music theory Um, repetitious practice can go, right, can go online, meaning you might have to explain some things in person if you're that, if you're a tactile type teacher, although I have some ideas for that as well. Um, But then the, the actual checking for understanding doesn't have to happen in class. That could happen through an online quiz of some kind, super easy to create, super easy to assess. I know I like in Schoology that it has a function where, and I'm sure there are some other programs that do this, where if I want to make sure I know that a kid understands key signatures, they, that they know how to find dough, which is in my class, why we care about key signatures, uh, movable dough, yes, um, is that I could take the, the, the a Schoology quiz that a student has to take over and over and over until they get X percentage correctly, which means that I'm not in the room with them. They're working on this at home but I know that it's not gonna let them finish the assignment until they've gotten the right number correct. And if with key signatures, if you've named seven or eight or nine keys, you pr- at that point, you probably understand all the rules and you, or you've got them memorized one or the other and don't really care. So get rid of that, put it online. And before we continue, I'm just gonna jump in real quick and thank the sponsors for the Coralosophy podcast. Starting out with the newest sponsor, 
mymusicfolders.com. They are, of course, famous right now for having created and invented what I really believe is the best singer's mask on the market. That is called their Resonance Singer's Mask. They have lots of masks on their website, but the Resonance Mask is the ideal for any amount of time that you spend singing this upcoming year for several reasons. It's the most comfortable. It's also the safest. And there, I'm not going to name the names of products, but I've seen some competitors floating around out there that I'm really concerned about. Uh, there are some that try to tr take the design that they came up with at My Music Folders. They, they came up with this idea of using wiring to hold the mask away from your lips and tongue and teeth so you can articulate. But in the process, I've seen some competitor masks out there where you can visibly see when a person is wearing them that the fabric is not even touching their face. Uh, it's there are gaps everywhere. Well, this mask is really well made, uh, and it's the seal around your face is quite good. And it also comes with some amazing filters that you can use to uh, provide safety for the wearer. Because as you know, mask cloth masks really only create safety for the person that's across from you, uh, protecting from your exhalation. But they also have some optional filters that you can put in these masks that protect you. On the inhale as well, so it's a really it's a really cool product. Uh, plus, they of course have choir folders that you can get. They have lots of other choir related products at mymusicfolders.com. You can enter Coralosophy at checkout. Then, of course, we have sightreadingfactory.com. We have graphitepublishing.com and ryanmain.com. Those are all all websites that you can use Coralosophy at checkout. Uh, if you need sheet music, if you need sight reading materials. Last but not least. We have vocevista.com forward slash Coralosophy. And finally, the show is produced by Ryan Main, Michael Heron, Kyle Peterson, Steve and Kathy Kakachik, James Mock, and David Kowalsik. I think there's even ways with these music theory concepts to save time. I, I'm thinking back over my 18 years in the classroom, and I'm thinking about how many times I have re-explained time signatures. How many times I have re-explained key signatures to the same group of kids. And you're sitting there going, I have told you this 18 times, and it's way easier than your chemistry class, and you're getting an A in chemistry, right? Uh, kidding, of course, but you, we're not going to have that kind of time, right? We might be in a place where we have time to cover the concept once, let's do some practice, moving on. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be recording all of those critical theory lessons, I guess you could say. So the, the big concepts of music theory that they need to know, uh, when especially this is for the beginners, I'm going to be recording videos of myself doing those lessons. Then I'll be posting them in our Schoology environment so that if we I go over it in class and I get that kid to raise his hand, could you tell us the rules for sharps again? And I'll say, oh, bro, I'm sorry, but I don't have time but you can find them in the Schoology and you can watch that video, that lesson again that you just saw, you can watch that over and over and over, which by the way, I am uh, on my Patreon, that's patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy. You can find a lot of material, supplemental materials that I've created, whether it's these uh, patron only episodes. In this case, in August, I plan as I'm creating these videos, I'm gonna be linking private links on Patreon to the videos that I'm making so that you can, you're not going to want to use mine because they'll be, you know, my own personal flair, but to give you ideas in how, in some of the things that I'm doing uh, so that you can create something that makes sense for you. So one of the perks this month in Patreon uh, group is going to be, they're going to be able to see these videos that I'm making. But I think that's really important because there, again, it's all about maximizing time. How, how much can you outsource to your online environment? Um, individual sight reading work through Sight Reading Factory, which by the way, don't forget, you can use Coralosophy at checkout at Sight Reading Factory on unlimited numbers of orders. So if you, I got this question the other day from a listener, if you used the code last year on your order, you can use it again. You can use it as many times as you want to get that 10% discount on your membership and your students' memberships. But that's something that can go online, right? You can take some key instructions for sight reading do them in class, and then let them do their work outside of class so that that rehearsal time is not being taken up. Now, I do, I am going to advocate later that you still do in, in person sight reading uh, work as a group. So in, in a choral context, 
right? That you still have your three-part exercises, your two-part exercises, because that's an important skill. That's one of the things we can't do at home is have them practicing sight reading in a choral context, right? So that's, in my opinion, will be one of the those precious things that don't get kicked out. But as far as the student individually working on their own, in the past, in my curriculum, in our curriculum, in our school, we have devoted some class time in the past in person to helping kids one-on-one with sight reading. I think, even though that is a high value for me in, in, as a teacher, I think that is something that will have to go to get kicked out into the online environment, right? Me, just because we can. We can do that work in an online environment, and I'm looking for as many pieces I can pull out as possible to kick over into the online environment. <clears throat> Another obvious one for me is putting any types of, uh, we do a lot of listening activities and then discussions afterwards of the listening. Get them out. Get them out of the in-person environment. We can easily do that through Schoology or our online environment where we load the YouTube video in, we put in the prompts of the questions ahead of time as a class. And I know in Schoology, again, probably in lots of other uh, types of, of programs, you can put some type of a live discussion box into the, uh, the, the interface there with the video so that the people in the class that uh, make a comment or discuss the video, the other people in the class can see those comments so that it does at least have a sensation of being a group discussion. I know that's very important in my curriculum is we, I want the students talking amongst each other about music uh, so that they're giving their critiques and they're giving their uh, their thoughts in a way that they can bounce them off of the other members of the class. So I'm also thinking that there are some types of rehearsal elements that could be done fairly effectively in an online environment that translate into the actual performance of the music when we're together, when we're live. Okay, so thinking of it this way. Um, we know that we cannot yet have a real rehearsal on Zoom. Uh, the, the latencies problem is still there. Um, and so what I'm thinking about, though, is what if, and I'm sure many of you have done this already, so I'm probably not, this, this probably isn't as exciting for you, but this is what I'm planning to do, uh, is having certain types of rehearsals where the choir is present in a live Zoom call or Google Meets or whatever. Everybody's on mute except me. And I am simply conducting through the piece. Everybody's got their music out. Everybody's got their pencils out. Uh, there could be a, a demo recording created by me. Uh, there could be a, a keyboard practice track, something. And we go through the piece and I am simply getting the boring stuff out of the way. There's a breath there, sopranos. And here we're gonna lift in the tenors. Oh, that's gonna be a carry basses. Right. And in the meantime, all the singers are on the other end, taking notes, marking their scores, uh, doing it's a communal activity. Get through a little try to structure it in a way that you would a rehearsal so that it's not long and boring. Right. But the idea there is that so let's say we go through three pages of a piece of, of, a, of an octavo. Everybody's made their marks. Then I go ahead and stop. Everybody unmute if they have a question. Hey, can you what, what did you say in measure 22? Was that a lift for us or, right? And the, the goal in those can be short and sweet. And that's how I'm conceiving of them. They can be super short and sweet. The goal though, is that in that precious moment, when we come back together in live, live in person, none of those questions are still there. We just open up the books and we sing, right? Because for so many reasons, hybrid rehearsals, of course, uh, hybrid time in a school uh, or reduced rehearsal time just for the purpose of viral safety, right? As we've talked about a lot on the show already, it, your load exposure matters. So many of us, many of you will probably be shortening your rehearsals, even if you don't have to, right? So all of these things are designed, all of these ideas, as I'm formulating them, are with one goal in mind, which is how much of the, how many of the minutes, what percentage of the minutes that I do get to actually sing, again, whether it's super spaced out around, which by the way, is another reason I think this is important for us is if we are spaced out in all kinds of obnoxiously weird ways when we rehearse, think I've already been having nightmares about this of just the vocal taxation on myself that will be taken to, to run an efficient rehearsal and get all this information out there, 
right? If I'm having to stop a lot to remind people 40 yards away at the back of my performing arts center about the lift or the break or whatever it was that we were supposed to take on page 14, then my voice is gone by the end of the day, especially if I'm wearing a mask, because we do have to project a little bit more to be heard in a mask, right? So I, all of these formulations for me are what are ways that I can most eat, most assuredly guarantee that in my maybe 30 to 40% of normal time that I get with the singers, can we just have a rehearsal where we're singing the whole time, go home, right? Then we, we have the chance to come back together online in some type of a Google Meet and talk about the rehearsal that we just did. Re re repeat the process. I get to go through the score, everybody's muted. <clears throat> we get to discuss the things that went well, discuss the parts we forgot to implement. And we have a, a very empowering in, in rehearsal environment there, uh, which for high school students, a lot of your listeners are high school students, uh, I think, or college students, these methods could work really, really well. Uh, I think they could work well with younger students as well. So elementary school, middle school. But again, this kind of leads me to my one of my next points, which is that if you are adjusting the repertoire to this scenario, that's going to be critical as well. So even with younger students, if they're being asked, to, this is because this is a big ask to ask our singers to take this much kind of proactive um, information in and out of the rehearsal, right? Because a lot, especially in the school environment, they are kind of used to just showing up and getting the information while they're there, right? Uh, now, of course, at higher levels in collegiate work, uh, they expect they are already expected to do this type of stuff in some ways. So that might work pretty well. So uh, to the repertoire choice, are we going to have to do less music? Yes, probably. In some cases, we're going to do easier music. Yeah, probably. Because again, what are the priorities? So for me, I want to have those efficient rehearsals. Another priority for me is that we're not doing repertoire that leaves no time left in those short precious rehearsals for vocal technique development so that they're still getting that chance to practice all the fundamentals of just making noise. I know that this is a pet peeve of mine at the high school level where a lot of my job and our job at the high school level is just teaching them how to take a breath and make a noise, which I know that seems obvious, but for those of you who haven't been in the trenches teaching young kids who have never sung before, the typical thing when they first come to us is a very uncoordinated onset where it's actually quite difficult for them to make a noise that consists of anything but exhaling air, right? So we've got to be able to still focus on that, especially with those freshmen and sophomore singers, the younger singers, the seventh and eighth graders, the elementary school kids, there still has to be a priority placed on the phonation and on just the, the healthy breath and singing and connection, connecting to the breath. So a repertoire choice plays into that. Uh, I, and I think most of us probably have already intuitively figured that out, that we're not going to be able to necessarily do the same major works that we normally do, right? There's going to be a lot of small ensemble singing, maybe a little bit less Devisi, uh, maybe just shorter pieces overall, um, things that are creatively even maybe some new commissions that lend themselves well to spacing. We talked a little bit with Eric Whitaker on the last episode about that. So these are all important things. So this, I'm going to focus a little bit now more on the sight reading. So the sight reading, uh, the in-class sight reading work, uh, I'm going to make a case here again, and I will also draw your attention back to some previous episodes. I'm going to make an, a case for now is the most important time ever to focus on literacy. Because if we are going to be short on time, the best weapon we're going to have is a choir who reads well. And so what I'm going to do, I'm not going to go through the whole process again. I'm simply going to direct you and I'm going to put links in the show notes to episode 18 of this show, which was called Ripping Off the Band-Aid, still one of the most popular show episodes on the show in the history of the show. And it is my full philosophy and practice in one episode of how I teach the choir to sight read through our everyday work. Okay. Now <clears throat> you're going to say, if, if I'm short on time, do I really have time to spend 15 minutes each day or 10 minutes each day? In my case, it's usually about seven minutes each day working on sight reading with the whole class. And I'm going to say, you again, you don't have time not to. 
because of how much quicker then, and it can happen within the span of a school year, okay, how much quicker they will access the music, saving you time later. So again, jump into the podcast feed or on the YouTube channel, go back to episode 18, ripping off the Band-Aid, listen to that, uh, then listen to episode 19, again, if you're newer to the show, because we talk, Eric Barnum and I talk about a concept called anti-fragility in the choral rehearsal, which plays in to uh, singers learning how to, well, for lack of a better term, be brave and just sing, okay? There's a psychological element in there that's going to come to play too with our young beginning singers. We have to figure out ways to make mistakes a safe place. We're going to be in a hurry in our rehearsals, right? How do we as teachers not pass that stress on to the singers in a way that's not healthy and that they can't handle, Okay, so uh, that those two episodes go kind of hand in hand. So I strongly recommend going back to those episodes and checking those out. Uh, another idea for things that can be done in a hybrid and a back and forth kind of a way is the use of the Voce Vista video software in class. Okay, <clears throat> this is a software that analyzes the, the vocal spectrum of overtones. Okay, how could we use that in a back and forth environment? Well, in my practice with Boche Vista, what I've been doing over years, not just in this last recent or this recent bit, is taking recorded samples of your students' voices. You can import them into Voce Vista even if they're not present physically. Okay, that's huge for what we're doing right now. Think about the times of the Zoom lessons you've taught. It's one of the frustration, uh, one of the frustrating elements of a Zoom lesson is that you don't hear the student very well. You can kind of hear the mechanics, but you don't hear, really hear the resonance. You don't really hear the overtones because the live streaming element of Zoom or Skype or whatever can't handle that much information. So it's giving you a very low resolution picture of what the kids are actually sounding like, okay? So you can give them, you can give them tips on certain things when they're doing a Zoom lesson, but we know that there is a little bit left to be desired there. So what I've done, is with Voce Vista, I can tell the student to record at home using whatever the best setup that they can come up with is. Sometimes it's just their iPhone camera. <clears throat> okay, but what's happening on a tech level there is that a recording of the student that's not having to be filtered through a live internet, like a Wi-Fi stream, that, that recording, even if it's just an, uh, an iPhone camera, is picking up a lot more resonance and recording it and storing that information in a higher resolution than the, the Zoom transmission would be, right? So you get them to make their recording. You They email you the MP3. And then if you want to do some type of a summative evaluation of how their voice is growing, you can import it then into Voce Vista video. The entire spectrograph of their, their sound comes up on the screen. You can see where their overtones are rich, where they you can see where the breathy stuff is starting to escape. You can hear it at a higher detail, higher level of detail. And then you can send them back feedback. And this is a really slick tool, Screencast-O-Matic, any type of screencasting software, QuickTime will do it if you have a Mac person. You can then record your feedback to them as you're watching it on Voce Vista. You can circle things, you can show them some of the spots that they need to work on. And then between that point and your next lesson, they've got homework. You can send them the file so that they can see uh, their, own, their own overtones. It's a really awesome software. The way that works is you have your vocevista.com backslash Coralosophy forward slash. I got some audience feedback. I've been doing that the whole time, the whole wrong way. It's forward slash. So vocevista.com forward slash Coralosophy. And you can download that software for 30 days for free. Okay. Play with it. See if it's something that you would incorporate in this time, in this environment. And then if you like it, it'll prompt you to pay for it, at which point you can enter the Coralosophy checkout code, get 10% off, okay? So all these ideas are kind of spinning into my mind as a way to think outside the box, to think about a way we could structure a choral rehearsal in a, in a hybrid environment where some singing is starting to happen. Now, not, you'll notice that nothing in this episode is COVID-related or safety-related, because I'm gonna assume that by the point you have started your in-person rehearsals, that you've worked that stuff out with your district, with your local health officials. Hopefully you've used 
uh, recent episodes on this show as some information for that. Uh, if you have not had a chance to check out those episodes, they are at uh, coralosby.com forward slash COVID hyphen conversations, and you can go back and review all that information. So we're not really talking about that in this little episode. What we're talking about is tools that when it's time for you, wherever you live to come back and sing, we're going to assume there's some, some short time there. How do we fill it, right? What are the types of things that will speed up your rehearsals? Uh, these are uh, another one that we could take out probably. Discussions about text, right? About the text. That could happen in an online environment. That's easy. That's easy. We could have a meeting scheduled during normal class time, but, but, but we're at home, right? I'm just making this off, off the top of my head, where today we're going to pull out the poetry and we're going to analyze the poetry. Because again, in my rehearsals in real life, everything before COVID was real life, by the way. It's not real life now. But everything in real life we used to do, we would do that in class. We love talking about poetry in my class. Well, that's a fairly easy one to do online. We can get the group of even 80 if we needed to, to sit there and be on a Zoom call and let people raise their hand and share their interpretations of the text. These are all things, again, that once we get together, we no longer have to talk about those things. So to kind of review, again, I try to said I'd try to keep this short. If it can go online, get it out. If you can do it, through the interwebs, do it through the interwebs. Saving time. Music theory. <coughs> individual sight reading work. Listening activities. Poetry analysis. Maybe even some types of rehearsal elements. Getting the boring stuff out of the way. All that stuff could probably be done online. Sight reading instruction. In class, in choral contexts. Still really important. Because that's going to save time later. It will speed up your rehearsals if your choir can open up a piece of music and just sing. Adjusting the repertoire to fit the time demands. What priorities do you need to maintain in teaching the singers how to actually sing? And how does that inform the limited, probably, repertoire selections that you can make? And then finally, we're going to wrap this up with hybrid performance ideas, right? So we've been thinking about the class period. What about when it comes time to finally let people hear the work, this creative work that we've been doing? What even is a hybrid performance? Well, I've got some thoughts. There might be types of, there might be times in your community where a live public performance is just not an option anyway, right? And, and my, again, I'm guessing and prognosticating, maybe it, over the course of one school year, there will be t the COVID situation in your area will have changed so much that you have some place times when you can and some times when you can't. So my guess, though, is that in any type of situation, we're going to want to be able to maximize social distancing, minimize the accumulation of crowds, okay, no matter what, probably until we're all vaccinated, right? So let's start thinking about ways we could hybridize even a live performance. One of the big things that's important in my mind when we do concerts at a school is that I want the younger singers to hear the older singers and vice versa because it, that's a recruiting nightmare for us if we can't have our freshmen at a concert hearing the upperclassmen and going, oh, I want to do that someday. I want to be in that group, right? That's how we hook them is at that first concert in October. But... <clears throat> If we can't fit that many people in the PAC and maintain social distancing, we might not be able to have a concert with everybody present so that everybody can hear each other. So what are some ways we could preserve that? My first thought is at the bare minimum, breaking down the choirs at your school into smaller concert pods. <coughs> so to use my, I'll just use my program as an example and you could probably tweak it to make sense for, for you. We have six choirs on campus. Well, a concert pod could be two choirs. Our, our PAC normally under normal circumstances, our performing arts center normally seats all those people with all their grandmas and uncle Tim and everybody can come, right? Well, in this environment, maybe that's not possible. So we have a social distancing requirement when we have a live performance. Concert pod might be one beginning choir with one advanced choir. 
or more advanced. Okay. The younger kid gets to hear the old, an older kid, older kid gets to support a younger kid. We have a fraction of the, the audience members present and we stagger those concerts throughout the evening so we can flush out the air, freshen the room, bring in the next group. That's one. Maybe even that ends up being too many people. So then we got to do one, one choir at a time. Well, then we get into the, the hybrid aspect. What if we had the, uh, a younger choir in the room while a more advanced choir was performing with only the parents and audience members of the advanced choir, but the kids could watch also. And when it was time for the younger choirs to get up on stage to perform, we kick out a group of parents and bring, out the, bring in the next group of parents still preserving the opportunity for our students to support each other, but keeping the, the audience to a minimum. These are all just ideas, kind of spitting them off the top of my head, figuring out ways to keep within whatever your local requirement is for gatherings, but still being able to perform in some type of a recital format uh, where people are coming and going at different times throughout the evening to allow for social distancing. What if none of that's even possible? Could hybrid performances look like some type of a live streaming event? I think they could. Uh, it's easier to control for spacing when there's no audience there at all, right? So it could be that if your rehearsal environment is, is your performing arts center, but spread out throughout the room, like mine may be, we could set up the live stream equipment, tell the parents we're really sorry, you can't come. and But the students go ahead and come up in the evening then we can still preserve some of that culture of getting all dressed up in the evening and putting on our choir gear and coming up to the school and doing a concert. <clears throat> the parents though, stay at home. We've got the live streaming stuff set up and we do one choir at a time, show up, stream your concert. Next choir shows up, stream your concert, everybody goes home. So what I, again, trying to think about the overarching aspect of this is for if and when we are in this situation where we're having to be creative on the fly to preserve as many activities as we can that make kids want to sign up for our classes. And I say, I use the term kids very broadly here in a music education um, setting. How much of that can we preserve while still maintaining as many safety elements as we possibly can risk mitigators uh, and all of that. So I hope you I hope this was at least stimulating. What I would love for you to do, if you can, is share episodes, go to the Coral Philosophers Facebook page and drop your ideas, especially in the hybrid uh, environment. Feel free to say, hey, I just listened to the hybrid uh, uh, ideas episode and here is what we're planning to do because this again is not because I think I've got all this figured out. As I mentioned earlier, I have no idea if any of this is gonna work. But these are the types of things that I'm starting to think about. So feel free to jump over to Coral Ospers on Facebook and add your ideas to a post and we'll start having this conversation. Other things you can do to help, of course, are head over to Patreon, patreon.com backslash Coralosophy, sorry, forward slash Coralosophy. And you can, for as little as $3 a month, jump on and support the show in a very real way. Uh, the, the costs and the expenses of doing a show are just kind of don't go away. <laughs> But I'm looking already at uh, my hosting having to increase by triple in the next probably three or four months, just because I've stored so much content now. I've got to keep paying to have it hosted. So Patreon is really covering the bill for that, uh, making sure that I can keep affording to do the show. So you can jump on over there. Plus, I put on patron-only episodes, uh, the site reading and the grading. Episode 21, by the way, is another one to go back and listen to. I've got all of my grading um, materials and, and the process, which is a quite a unique process uh, to grade. The, the supplemental materials are also posted on the Patreon page. So the Patreon environment is awesome in that way, is it takes us off social media and we can continue some of these conversations should you choose to use it that way. Sometimes people just want to support the show, which is also awesome. So patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy. And finally, the last thing you can do to help us out is to remember to use the show's sponsors when you make related purchases. It really helps a lot. It shows them that you are listening. Uh, those sponsors are sightreadingfactory.com, graphitepublishing.com, ryanmain.com, which are sheet music publishers online, Voce Vista Video, which I mentioned earlier, and mymusicfolders.com are all websites where if you enter Coralosophy at checkout, you're going to get a discount code 
and it helps us out a lot. So thank you so much. I hope this was, was helpful. You might have noticed it's a little bit less structured than normal, uh, but this was kind of a fly by the seat of my pants episode. I was thinking and I wanted to think with you all. So thanks for listening and stay tuned.